Amazon is burning in Brazil at a record rate. Terrifying scale of Australia's bushfire disaster is beginning to emerge. Fleeing from the flames is just one of many animals around Australia. But according to conservationists, today in North Borneo, they say that less than 20% of virgin rainforest remains standing. And people have been evacuated from homes and campsites near the Marseille region of France. When forests on land are lost to fires, hurricanes, storms, or deforestation, the world's press sounds the alarm. Rescue teams are deployed. NGOs, activists, and governments wake up and send resources and funding. The world is in shock, yet united. At present, extremely valuable wild ecosystems are being decimated voluntarily. Amazing forests are disappearing. Yet little is said and lots remains to be done. Species go missing, biodiversity is lost and coastal communities suffer. Many have highlighted coral loss and large-scale bleaching. Occasionally, some discuss the importance of mangroves and seagrass beds. Unfortunately, there is not enough awareness about an equally concerning issue. The loss of large kelp forests. These forests are essential to the life of the oceans and the planet. Scientists have recognized them as the most productive and vigorous ecosystems on Earth. Kelps are truly amazing, far more important than many believe. In fact, they should be compared to the largest trees in a rainforest, to a sequoia or an oak tree. Seaweed fossils show that they have been around for over 1.2 billion years. Kelps, like mangroves, also act as a barrier against tsunamis and storms and help to avoid erosion. They are also a key, they also play a key role in coastal protection, um, mitigating the impacts of storms and heavy wave conditions. Kelp forest is uh, one of the blue forests that we have along the coast. It is a very important ecosystem. It just one square meter of kelp houses uh, up to 100,000 organisms and maybe two to 300 different species. In addition, kelps, like the plants on land, use photosynthesis to absorb CO2 and grow biomass. They can absorb carbon at rates between 10 to 50 times greater than the forests on land, making them a real climate solution. The 
Kelp is a part of the marine vegetation, so it stores carbon in the same way that uh, every plant uh, on the planet does. So it's uh, similar to the forest, so it grows and stores carbon in the standing biomass along the coast. So it's really an important part of the carbon flux and it stores uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Our estimates are that a natural kelp forest can fix approximately 3,000 tons of carbon per square kilometer per year. So it's a lot of carbon. It is now certain that seaweed can help reverse the damage done by fossil fuels. Furthermore, if technology continues to develop, kelp would certainly become the most sustainable and eco-friendly food source on the planet. One hectare of a seaweed farm can produce more protein than the same amount of land used for cattle. We have uh, big pools and we pump in carbon dioxide from the Southern Hemisphere's largest distillery um, and uh, grow the seaweed really fast. We could do 100 tonnes on a hectare in a year of dried seaweed product from 1,000 tonnes of wet seaweed. And if you compare that to wheat, you get about two tonnes. So, so much faster, doesn't use fresh water, so a really sustainable way to get food, and importantly, really nutritious food. These multi-level functions make seaweed an indispensable actor, not only for the survival of marine species, but for our own well-being. Unfortunately, kelp forests are vulnerable to environmental conditions and are directly exposed to human-related stresses. The impact of these threats has increased in number and severity in recent decades, challenging the resilience of kelp forests. And when uh, natural vegetation and land is destroyed, to produce, for example, agricultural fields rich in, in um, uh, fertilizers, etc. Um, the, all the erosion that is caused by the, the destruction of natural vegetation, plus the excess nutrients that will be washed onto the sea, uh, destroy marine forests in the sea. Marine forests need light, and very turbid waters with a lot of particles and turbidity are not suitable. So when we are destroying and affecting terrestrial ecosystems, we are destroying the habitat for marine forests in the sea. As carbon dioxide levels rise in the atmosphere, more of the gas is dissolved into the oceans, making them more acidic. When combined with warming oceans, heat waves and pollution, this has a devastating impact on coral reefs and seaweed ecosystems. Sadly, many large areas of kelp in the world have now vanished. California has lost more than 94%. Tasmania, up to 95%. Some areas of Norway, up to 80%. And Canada, around 67% of their kelp forests. Regrettably, many other parts of the world are suffering from a similar fate including parts of Britain and Portugal. And when I moved back to California, actually one of my, the things I was looking forward to the most uh, was getting back in the water in those kelp forests. And when I did come back, it was really disappointed to see just how drastically um, the kelp cover had decreased. One of my favorite kelp forests on Catalina, which was larger than a couple football fields in size, is completely gone. There isn't a single uh, frond of kelp left over there. So as a result, the macrocystis or giant kelp forests have now gone, literally gone. 30 years ago, you could go in any of the little bays here off the east coast of Tasmania and it used to be a bit of a pain because it used to be catching on your propellers on your little outboards and it, it was a bit of a pain. It was everywhere, very thick, but now it's gone. 
completely gone off the east coast of Tasmania. Imagine if 70 cases of forests of eucalyptus on land disappear from Sydney, people would notice and would raise their arms and, and tell the government fix this. The same thing happened but underwater and no one even knew about it. So it's, uh, that's the increasing awareness is one of the things that we want to do. Simply astonishing that despite such awful global trends, some countries choose to disregard these dramatic consequences and instead advocate their nation as a wild kelp logging country. A recent paper by the FAO confirms that Chile is the number one wild harvester of kelp forests, followed well behind by China, Norway, and Japan, who together do not reach Chile's volume. Chile alone accounts for almost 40% of global harvesting of wild kelp. This sounds particularly threatening when we know that Chile holds one third of the world's macrocystis ecosystems and large extensions of other brown algae. Chile, together with West South Africa, have some of the only waters around the world that are actually cooling. But instead of helping kelp to thrive naturally, human extraction is reducing its stock. Chile is a question completely human, the humana, de exploitation de del barreteo que, como le dicen, de estos bosques de alga. More worrisome is that while other nations expand the farming of seaweed, Chile keeps exploiting natural marine wild forests and does little to develop farming. Chile's government agency, Serna Pesca, and the FAO confirm that only 5% of total seaweed production in the country comes from aquaculture. In comparison, it represents only 0.1% of the total aquaculture produced by China. Future United Nations climate change conferences will be under constant pressure to deliver a legal framework for the preservation and restoration of the ocean's blue carbon assets. Countries such as Britain would need to show leadership. It has 26,000 square miles of underwater kelp forests, so twice the size of its land forest. However, most government policies are around reforesting land, while totally forgetting the importance of its 12th longest coastline in the world. The Sussex coast has lost most of its kelp, and other areas in the UK are suffering a similar fate. It is the result of trawling, pollution, and sediment deposit. Given its massive CO2 sequestration and the alarming rate whereby we are destroying these coastal habitats, protection of these blue carbon assets must be at the front of any agenda for both climate and ocean action. It sounds only reasonable that kelp should be incorporated into any law, agreement or protocol when addressing climate change. Países de todo el mundo tienen que comprometerse a proteger los bosques de alga, a cuidarlos. Esa es la primera tarea. Una vez que tengamos eso claro, podemos empezar a pensar en, su, en las actividades económicas, en la extracción. Pero hoy día estamos partiendo al revés. Estamos partiendo por la extracción y finalmente por la conservación. No podemos proteger algo que ya está en peligro. Ese peligro además pone en peligro no solamente a La, la comunidad, al ecosistema el cual vive y que está relacionado con estas algas, sino que también pone en peligro y, y, y los hace más vulnerables también a comunidades enteras, a gente que vive esos recursos. 
la gente que ya en muchos casos es bastante pobre y vulnerable económicamente y que por lo tanto perdiendo esos recursos van finalmente a perder también actividad económica actual y potencialmente futura. For centuries, seaweed has been utilized as a food source. The first cultivation began in Japan in the 17th century, and commercial farming took off in the 1950s. It's an old industry. People have been eating seaweeds for millennia. You know, South America's had um, uh, the original people there traveling inland to develop the Aztec civilization, carrying seaweed in their satchels. It's been essential for humans forever. Today, many products we consume or use on a daily basis contain seaweed. While it is often consumed as a direct food product in the East, Western countries consume it primarily after it's been processed into flour, powder, or more specific extracts. So this is the processing plant for seaweed. Uh, we had to work out how do we dry this seaweed? How do we um, make extracts from it? Um, how do we process those? And that took a long time. It was all in the lab bench. And now from the test tubes, it's come up to this scale. So this series of tanks is where we do different reactions and take out the different polymers from our seaweed. Um, and we get uh, our bright green seaweed powder that goes into um, our, our product. But we also have a protein rich fraction that we make in this system here and we put that uh, into our mueslis and snack bars. Agar, carrageenan and alginate are the most commonly used seaweed extracts. The secret to kelp's versatility is the algin, a complex carbohydrate serving as an emulsifying and bonding agent in industrial processes. The algin is extracted from kelp and used as a stabilizer and emulsifier in many food products like ice cream, yogurt, beer, and jam. After we came up with the idea that the origins of kombucha come from kombu, which is a Japanese kelp, and cha, so kombu cha, which is seaweed tea. And so really we're taking kombucha back to the origins, kombucha, seaweed tea. Seaweed is also now considered a superfood and its benefits as an antioxidant, an anti-inflammatory, as well as its anti-aging and anti-cancer properties are undisputed. And we also, in this factory here, uh, make extracts um, that we use in clinical studies for gut health and skin care and wound healing research. This is the extract from our seaweed that we use to make the wound healing um, products. So we use it as a bio ink. We make it into a gel and we can 3D print it into a scaffold with human skin cells um, and grow full thickness skin tissue because those cells are really happy on this extract and start to make collagen, elastin. Nowadays, scientific research keeps expanding the use of seaweed to new industries like cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, textiles, agri-food and more. Even though one of the most recognized uses of seaweed has been crop fertilization, a recent study by researchers at the University of California confirmed that supplementing cattle food with a particular type of red seaweed reduced their methane emissions by over 90%. Well, there's great opportunity for seaweeds to help reduce enteric methane emissions of ruminant livestock. The, um, then there are two species of seaweed that have been identified so far that are local to Australia and could potentially help with that. They're relatively hard to breed and harvest, but there are some vegetative growth methods that look promising. According to CSIRO, less than 1% feed supplement can eliminate more than 90% of the enteric methane emissions of ruminant livestock. The demand for kelp has grown so much in the last 20 years that for most people it is no longer a matter of collecting wild seaweed on the beach after a storm has washed it out. The wild forests of kelp, Lesonia, Bertiorana 
or locally known as Wiero Negro, and Lasonia trabeculata or Wiero Palo in northern Chile, are in high demand in Asia and around the world. The high prices that have triggered a gold rush exploitation of wild marine forests will soon give the northern Chile Atacama Desert its marine extension, where little exists. Taking any potential income from tourism or fishing away from coastal communities. Lugares con algas, con bosques de algas, se han transformado en verdaderos, no solamente lugares de ciencia, de investigación, de entender estos ecosistemas, pero también, particularmente hoy, y con el crecimiento increíble del buceo y de las actividades de ecoturismo, ha crecido interés por, para visitarlo, digamos, porque son lugares impresionantes donde se pueden encontrar distintas especies. As the kelp forest is extracted, hundreds of other marine species go missing. Meanwhile, Chilean fishermen have become loggers and can now cut one and a half tons of wet kelp and earn in excess of 1,000 US dollars for a couple of hours' work. They operate under government quotas and although major irregularities do exist, like in any high-value commerce, their extraction is legal. Unfortunately, their most rapid and effective extraction technique involves taking the entire root or holdfast out, hence destroying the surrounding marine life. For many reasons, it is absolutely imperative that we protect our kelp forest. Después del evento de extracción, cierto, de estas algas que puede ser en las zonas de transición, o sea, la zona intermarial, eh, este huiro negro ocurre en esta zona donde hay más incidencia de la luz, por lo tanto, su crecimiento puede ser más rápido y por ende su recuperación después de un evento de extracción. No así aquel que ocurre bajo el agua, que es el huiro palo. Eh, el recurso limitante luz, ¿cierto?, eh, hace que estas algas eh, crezcan eh, a una tasa menor que aquellas que ocurren en, en zonas de transición. Y es importante highlight que uh, marine forests no son todos los mismos. Just because we have a large biomass, a large area covered by large forests of macroalgae, um, they are different, as I explained, because of the genetic diversity and their unique characteristics. Uh, make them different from each other. And so once a population that uh, is comprised of unique endemic uh, genetic lineages disappears, there is no way of recovering it because the, you can have lineages that become extinct. And we see this. Um, if we can, we can recover the biomass, but we cannot recover the evolutionary potential that was lost. Today, we know that the Chilean government's advisors assigned quotas prematurely and without sufficient research. No one knew if those kelp forests could ever recover or how long that would take. It is uncertain if a forest can be rebuilt to what it was before, as herbivores such as snails, slugs and sea urchins tend to stop any potential regrowth. donde se hace esta extracción, eh, hay una menor cantidad de depredadores, lo que hemos visto en nuestra investigación, es que eh, los erizos y los caracoles, que son herbívoros, consumen estas algas, limitando así más aún el, el acceso a la recuperación y el acceso cierto, al crecimiento de estas algas. Large extensions of former California kelp forest are now densely populated by sea urchins.
While reforestation on land is undergoing a substantial expansion and has become common practice, the kelp reforestation remains in its research stage. We figured out by doing experiments that the way to do it is to bring back parents, I guess, so adult reproductive seaweeds from nearby populations and create these little forests in the areas that we want to restore and we um, basically let them reproduce. Those guys eventually do so and after six months more or less you start getting uh, crabies or babies of, of this, of this uh, crayweed. They grow fine, they become reproductive themselves and then they start reproducing and those populations start self-expanding. Um, and then what we do is after a year or so we, we basically remove the ones that we planted in because those guys do not reattach naturally to the rock. So to plant them here we need to put some meshes on the rock and so on, which we, we then remove and we let those populations sort of like thrive and, and expand. Our chance to intervene and restore the natural conditions are to use wave energy, solar energy, perhaps even wind energy, to restore natural upwelling, irrigate kelps offshore, and be able to regenerate the production. And our early trials last year have been really successful. We were able to demonstrate, first of all, in the Philippines that we could upwell water, irrigate the seaweed, and we got four times the growth rate of the normal seaweed with deep water irrigation. The scalability of kelp forest restoration is still a considerable challenge. There have been some successful experiments on a small to medium scale. However, a large global restoration seems to be, for most people, a rather long-term goal. Hence, it seems only wise to stop wild logging until we can have an effective and economically viable way of replanting. Chile, contrary to many countries in the world, lacks an export limit for its marine biomass and kelp export. While the quotas have little or no control, hence encouraging further unregulated exploitation. Kelps are known as ecosystem engineers. They create, maintain, and modify habitats by substantially changing the chemical and physical composition of substrates. More than 150 marine species live directly under the Chilean kelps, or algas pardas. Kelps provide food and shelter. Kelp forests are natural nurseries to many fish species and invertebrates, such as krill and mollusks. Up to 100 species live around the holdfast alone, and several hundred species are indirectly dependent on it. The bosques de algas son finalmente verdaderos eh, jardines infantiles de montones de especies que luego también se van incluso hacia otros sectores del océano. Por lo tanto, especies pequeñas se reproducen en ellas, crecen en ellas y luego se desarrollan. Si perdemos estos lugares, perdemos también entonces muchas especies costeras y muchas especies pelágicas. Indeed, it seems inconceivable that two endangered animals, such as the sea otter, the smallest marine mammal in the world, and also the blue whale, the largest animal that ever lived on the planet, depend on kelp as the food for both animals develops around these forests. Around 
around the world, 220 species of seaweed have commercial value. Its cultivation takes place in about 50 countries. Seaweed cultivation has now proven itself as a much more environmentally friendly process than fish farming. Its capacity for growing naturally with no feed, pesticide, medicine or fertilizer has been widely recognized, making it the fastest growing aquaculture industry. We wonder today why Chile has not delivered on its promises to pursue the more sustainable and environmentally friendly route of farming seaweed. Its 6,400 kilometer long coast, despite being sometimes rough and hostile, benefits from the planet's richest waters. It will most certainly present many opportunities. The FAO states that a significant issue with wild seaweed is the possibility of contamination by heavy metals such as arsenic and mercury. These act as a restraint on market expansion, especially in countries that place a high premium on food safety and sustainability. The FAO continues, farmed production is likely to continue growing as wild harvest stagnates or declines due to overexploitation, changing environmental conditions and water pollution. It is estimated that in 2024, the global market value of seaweed will be more than double the 2017 market size. A mí me gustaría ver en Chile que se hicieran eh, más estudios, más experimentos, que así como como se está explotando ahora y la verdad es que se se están cargando no solamente el el guiro, sino que también todos los peces y los moluscos y los crustáceos que viven directa o indirectamente asociados a estos ecosistemas. Farming could be carried out by many coastal communities while also improving their standard of living. Like any business, this will require training, technical support and funding. On the other hand, today's Chilean loggers would also need to accept dropping their income and abandon once and for all the destruction of the Atacama's ecosystems. that will inevitably bring poverty and ruin to their families, friends and communities. <laughs>